All right, welcome to your amphibian video notes. So before we even get started on types of amphibians, we're gonna talk about general amphibian characteristics. So the name amphibia itself means double life. And this is because amphibians do one of two things. They either live one stage of their life in water and one stage on land, or they move back and forth between water and land during their lifetime. The earliest amphibian fossil then suggests that evolutionary transition from fish who spend their entire lifetime in water to amphibians that are spending part of their lifetime. And the name of this fossil is Ichthyostega. Then, also important to note that amphibians are the first tetrapods that we're going to be studying. And tetrapod just means four foot. When we talk about nutrition and digestion, most of the larvae that you'll see are herbivores. So tadpoles typically are what the larvae are, and they feed on algae or different plant matter. However, when they transition into adults, they become carnivores. So amphibians are, first of all, the organisms we see with the first true tongues. And this enables them to do something called the flip and grab method of feeding that frogs and toads do, or also just to grab their prey like salamanders might. And they do have teeth, some of them, not all, but these are just for holding prey, not necessarily for chewing their prey. And you can see a video down there of a frog doing the flip and grab method. And then also up here at the top, you see a frog as it's sticking its tongue out to catch prey. When we talk about circulation, we previously talked about fish and I told you the emphasis on heart chambers. So as we're moving to more evolved organisms, we're gonna see more chambers. So amphibians are an example of this in that they have one ventricle and two atria for a total of three chambers. And it's also important to note that the atria is not quite fully divided in salamanders. So this is just once again, kind of showing that connection and that link as organisms have evolved. In terms of breathing, amphibians are unique in that they do something called cutaneous respiration. And this means that they breathe across their skin. And this can be up to 90% of their gas exchange. This is also why you see amphibians that burrow a bottom of a pond or something like that in the winter. They're still able to breathe across their skin in water as well. And this is why they'll still survive. They do spend a little bit of time doing something called bucopharyngeal respiration, and this is where they do it across the surface of their mouth and their pharynx. And it's also important to note that larvae and some salamander adults, as you'll see, have external gills, and so they breathe that way through their gills. When we talk about temperature, amphibians are ectothermic, meaning they rely on the outside environment to determine what their overall temperature is. So whether that's the water temperature that they're swimming in or the air that they're living in, that is going to determine their overall temperature. In terms of nervous and sensory, their brain is pretty, pretty developed for such a small organism. So they have three components. They have a forebrain, which is primarily for olfactory, a midbrain for vision, and then a hindbrain, which controls their motor skills. They also have these really cool things called chemoreceptors, and these are in their mouth, on their tongue, in their skin, and it helps them kind of recognize chemicals. So their mates they can recognize, they can locate food, and they can also detect like poisonous chemicals to them. Vision and hearing are also two really important characteristics, and they're more evolved in amphibians than we've seen so far. So vision itself is the most important sense for amphibians. They are sight feeders, so they rely on seeing their prey go by, and that's how they eat. And they also have binocular vision, which allows them to perceive different depths. They have something as well called a nictating membrane that covers their eyes, and it allows them to clean it, protect it, but also to, like, come up and come back down. So if you watch frogs blink, you'll see this in action. In terms of their hearing, frogs can, uh, frogs and toads, I should say, are able to do both low and high frequency sounds. Salamanders, on the other hand, they don't have quite the evolved eardrum that frogs and toads do. So they can only do low frequency vibrations that they do via the ground, what they feel. So frogs and toads are a bit more special too in that they have some pretty unique vocalizations. I'm sure you've all heard frog calls in the summer or springtime when you go outside. And these are used for several things. They can attract females primarily, but they also mark territory or kind of stake their claim for other males. And they can give distress calls if a predator is nearby. These calls, however, are species specific. So when you're outside, there's, I'm sure, gonna be multiple different species of frogs. They all have their own calls, just like birds all have their own bird songs. That way they know who's who within their species.
And like I said, this is only in frogs and toads. And it's important to note, too, that they do have a larynx and vocal cords. That's how they produce these sounds. But males also have something called a vocal sac, which you see in this guy here, which helps them attract those females to them. Excretion in water con conservation is also very similar in amphibians to fish. So depending on where they're at is going to depend on what their excretion substance is. So if they're in the water, they excrete ammonia, much like fish do, whereas when they're on land, it's urea, which is more common in reptiles and birds. Osmoregulation, then, is similar to fish, so this is a term you should be familiar with, and it's how they regulate their water amounts in their body. Once again, we have a difference in habitat. So aquatic amphibians or tadpoles must rid their body of excess water because they're always surrounded by water. Terrestrial, on the other hand, have to conserve water. So you can see how these differences are going to impact how they regulate their water, their water quantities within their body. And they do have several methods of conserving water in general. They can store it in their bodies. They'll curl up in groups sometimes, make cocoons. They have protective coverings. And they can also absorb water through their skin. So that's really helpful if they need to conserve it already on land. Movement of amphibians is pretty unique. We have two different things that we're seeing. So we're seeing salamanders and actually Sicilians that move kind of in a snake-like or fish-like fashion side to side. And then you see frogs and toads that are hopping or jumping. So the vertebrae themselves is modified to help provide that support on land. So fish have a more structured kind of vertebrae because they're in water and your weight is different, your mass is different in water. Whereas on land, they need more support and flexibility to maintain the body on land. Their pelvic girdle is going to be essential for attaching their hind limbs. And this is the first time we're seeing a pelvic girdle in an organism. They also have reduced body wall muscles. So if you remember, fish have very high percentages of muscles for movement. Amphibians instead rely on their appendages to move. And you'll see as well some similarities in that salamanders move similar to fish. So this is a fish over here, and then you see a salamander over there with the side to side. And as we talked about, frogs and toads are going to jump or hop, and they have something called a urostyle, which is like fused bones in their pelvic girdle that help them support that structure without having a tail. On to reproduction. So amphibians are kind of unique in their types of reproduction as well. So they're dioecious, meaning male and female, are those organs are in separate individuals, and their courtship kind of varies by their order. So salamanders are relying on scents and like visual cues, whereas frogs and toads rely on vocalizations. They have different calls that attract their mates. You also see the difference between external and internal fertilization. So frogs, toads, and some salamanders, not many, but some, will do external fertilization, and they utilize something called amplexus. So while it looks like in this picture that you see the frogs mating internally, you're not. Instead, the female is laying eggs, and the male is attached to her on top, and he drops his sperm over the eggs as she releases them from her body. Then you also see your internal fertilization methods with most of your other salamanders and your Sicilians. This is where the importance of water, though, comes into play, and in that the eggs must be in a moist environment. So even if they live on land, away from water, they have to go back to water to lay their eggs because tadpoles rely on water to survive. And that's what this fertilized egg usually develops into, and you'll see a bunch of those over here. So parental care is something kind of unique that you do see in some amphibians, but it's only about 10% of species actually do this. And interestingly enough, it's the males that are responsible for this task. It, it may be something as simple as just protecting the, mess, the nest. They also may brood the eggs, so put them in their mouth, on their back, um, just kind of sit on top of them. Or they'll make kind of paths for their tadpoles to get to different water sources. Their nest adaptations then are also important when there isn't parental care and that they can be surrounded by foam or they can even be hung over a body of water so when the tadpoles emerge they drop right into that water to begin that part of their life cycle. So metamorphosis then, this is something we've previously talked about in insects but Amphibians are also very widely known for their ability to metamorphosize. So this is just those drastic changes over time. Some of them will do incomplete metamorphosis and retain some structures, usually gills, which we'll talk about 
in a few slides, but for the most part, they're fully changing from an egg to a tadpole to an adult. And this helps just reduce that competition between stages. As we talked about, the larvae are eating plant matter and the adults are carnivores. Um, and also, as I'm hopefully I'm sure you know, frogs have the most dramatic process. So a frog starts from a tadpole with a tail to a frog that doesn't have a tail at all. So theirs is the most dramatic if you look in this picture here versus the salamander up here, which eh, looks relatively the same. So kind of some other interesting facts about frogs. So some frogs have toxic skin, and this means they have poison glands that are actually in their skin. They're poisonous to touch or eat, and they usually have these bright warning colors to detract predators, as you see in this guy over here. And the poison dart frogs, which is a, a very large amount of these frogs, they get this chemical from what they eat. So they consume this toxic plant that lives in the rainforest, but they don't have any effects to the toxin, and instead their body stores it. And the golden dart Poison dart frog, which is this little guy pictured here, actually has enough poison in its body to kill 10 adult men. So these are very, very lethal. And fun fact, why are they called poison dart frogs? Because in the rainforest, um, they would actually get these frogs and they would dip their like needles or their darts in their poison to shoot other tribes or invaders or other people to their villages. So the frog's skin was very, very beneficial. All right, so environmentally, frogs are very much at risk. So the, there's pollution and all of that. They're very, very susceptible to changes, especially in temperature and acidity and things like that. But primarily the worst thing is this deadly chytrid fungus. And this fungus is responsible for these massive die-offs of frogs, which th this down here just kind of shows you a little example of that. And this fungus, it only attacks the parts of their skin with keratin in them. So tadpoles really don't have very much keratin. So this is much more prominent once they become an adult. And the cause of death itself is still relatively unknown, but there's two major ideas. One, they get ulcers and roughening of their skin. And as you know, they do most of their respiration through their skin. So this is difficult for them to breathe. But the fungus also produces a toxin. So this toxin can eventually poison them as well. And there is some evidence pointing to the African clawed frog as this initial method of introduction. Because this frog species is essentially like a carrier of the disease, it doesn't have any impact from it, but it's unfortunately transported worldwide and used as research and also as aquarium pets. So this once again stems to people not being sanitary or if you work in a lab and then you go handle wild frogs or even things as simple as, oh, I don't want this frog in my fish tank anymore, I'm just gonna let it go. Well, you letting it go, exposes all of those local frogs to the toxins of this fungus. And then just briefly a little bit about the class diversity. So there's three different orders that we're going to focus on for amphibians. First is order Gymnophiona, and this means naked like a snake. So they do look very much snake-like. However, they are amphibians. They rely on water for their eggs. They also rely on that moisture in order to survive. And they are limbless, so they don't have limbs, and they're pretty much almost blind because they're usually in burrows. And your example here is Sicilians. Order caudata means to bear a tail, and these are your salamanders and your newts, and this really large one we have in North America called a hellbender. Um, they typically have internal fertilization without copulation. So the male is going to deposit the sperm packet, the female picks it up and puts it inside, and then as she lays her eggs, the sperm fertilize the eggs as they leave her body. The larvae here have external gills, but then sometimes we see these retained in adults, like this mud puppy over here that has these big, fabulous gills outside of its body. And then fun fact up here, this is a giant Asian salamander or Chinese salamander, and they actually do get that large. So imagine running into that in nature. And then lastly, we have order Anura. So this name means without tail, and these are your frogs and toads. They do external fertilization, like we talked about, and their larvae are typically aquatic. So the tadpoles are going to rely on water to survive, and then the adults live on land. The adults also have those muscular hind limbs and webbed feet. And a little bit more, just to kind of show you the difference. So frogs have smooth, wet skin, and toads are dry and warty. Frogs have teeth, toads don't. Jumping and leaping is what frogs do versus hopping and crawling for toads. And then their eggs look drastically different. So you see the long strings of toads over here. 
and the clumps or masses of frogs over there. And that is all.